As a franchise, Star Wars definitely has the perfect building blocks for an awesome RTS game. There's an abundance of cool ships, vehicles and troops, distinct opposing factions, and a whole galaxy of planets to fight over. But could a developer utilize these elements to create a fun strategy game? One where you can fight battles on land and in space? Can you build up fleets and armies to take over the entire galaxy? Can you strap explosives to Ewoks and make them suicide bomb your enemies? In Star Wars Empire at War, the answer to all of this is yes. It was released in 2006 and was the first game developed by Petroglyph, which was founded by former members of Westwood Studios after EA ordered its execution. Why? Why? In case you're unaware, Westwood was responsible for highly influential and classic RTS titles like Dune 2 and the Command and Conquer series. So right from the start, Empire at War had the potential to be really good. Petroglyph wasn't the first developer to take a crack at making a Star Wars strategy game, but what's more notable is that in the 17 years since Empire at War's release, there have been no new Star Wars RTS games. At least not officially. Instead, this void is filled with a number of high-quality total conversion mods for Empire at War that expand and improve upon the original game in many ways. There are various metrics for measuring a game's success. You can check Metacritic scores or look at sales figures, but I've always thought that a really good indicator is when a game gets supported and kept alive by its fans long after its release. However, despite this love it's received, the original game isn't without some faults, and it has several innovations that might make fans of more traditional RTS games a little confused if you try to jump in without learning how things work. If you're anything like I was the first time I played Empire at War, you'll want to immediately take control of the Empire, build up a massive fleet, and fly around the galaxy murdering everyone. Galactic Conquest mode lets you do this, but once you've taken over a few planets, you might find yourself getting attacked at places that you didn't properly defend, and the more you expand, the more overwhelming actually maintaining your empire can sometimes seem. That's why if you're new to Empire at War, it's a good idea to start by playing the campaigns after going through the tutorial missions. The campaigns walk you through Galactic Conquest scenarios slowly, and they do a good job at giving you time to get used to the game's mechanics before thrusting you into difficult situations. Then you'll be a lot less likely to get stomped by the enemy AI. You play as either the Imperials or the Rebels in the base game, and the Forces of Corruption expansion adds a third faction, the Consortium. So you have your standard heroes and villains, and the Consortium is an organized crime syndicate who thinks the others are losers and is only out to make a profit. There are more than 40 unique missions between these three factions, but you'll probably spend just as much if not more time managing resources and units, and attacking and defending planets to try and become the big boss of the galaxy. So there's a good amount of content here, and a lot to wrap your head around. But once you get the hang of things, trying to take over the galaxy using any of the three factions can get addicting. The events of the base game campaigns take place just before and during A New Hope, and it revolves around the construction of the Death Star and the Rebels' attempts to stop it. So kind of like Rogue One, but with the cast of the original movies. The story is serviceable, I guess. If you're familiar at all with the original trilogy, then the plot of the Rebel campaign is extremely predictable, and there's really nothing new and inventive that stands out about it. The Empire campaign has a slightly more unique story. There's a part involving a traitor you have to try and chase down, but it's pretty one-dimensional and there isn't much to get excited about. But it improves a lot in Forces of Corruption where you're given a much more original story. It revolves around Tiber Zahn, who isn't your typical Star Wars hero. He's a full-blown criminal who doesn't let his premature grey hair bother him, and he's more ruthless than what you normally see from a Star Wars protagonist. But it's pretty hard to take Zahn seriously because of how he's depicted visually. Forces of Corruption relies more heavily on cutscenes than the base game, and they look uh, pretty terrible. There's no upscaling from how he appears as a unit on the battlefield, and he must have chugged a bottle of glue or something because his mouth doesn't move at all when he talks. The rest of the story in both the base game and the expansion plays out via comm messages represented by these little holograms in the corner of your screen. The voice acting for these sounds spot on with their respective characters from the movies. So I was pretty surprised to learn that most of them were done by original actors, who just do some really good impressions. The campaigns give you a bunch of unique story missions that let you do some cool things. You'll team up with Wookiees, hijack AT-AT walkers, destroy planets with a Death Star, and visit some interesting places like a literal Star Wars museum. Then the final missions put you in some giant battles that are really fun and satisfying to take part in. But if you're playing the campaigns or Galactic Conquest, you need to learn how to use the Galactic Map before you even start thinking about space and land battles. It shows what part of the galaxy you control and everything you do in these two game modes starts here. It's not complicated, but it's still easy to get into frustrating situations if you're not sure exactly what to do. If you move your fleet to a planet that you don't control, a space battle starts if the enemy is hanging around. And then if you win, you send in your ground units to try and take over the planet. The opposing factions attack your planets the same way. Once you've taken control of a planet, you can build your own space station which helps defend from enemy fleets and lets you build more ships to add to your own fleet. 
On the ground, you need mining facilities to bring in more credits, the game's currency, and structures like barracks and factories to recruit ground troops and vehicles. Controlling planets and upgrading space stations increases your unit capacity, so it's not a good idea to just turtle in a corner. You need to expand, but in order to do this without spreading your fleet and resources too thin, you want to go after choke points that the enemy has to pass through in order to get to the rest of your territory. You can keep a big fleet and army here to hold things down and add some defensive structures. Planets also give you bonuses once you control them, like discounts on a specific unit type. So there's another strategic layer involving which ones you decide to go after. Once you have a grasp of the basics, it's a pretty simple and intuitive system of managing territory resources and units. And the grand strategy elements let you feel like you're actually conquering the galaxy, not just fighting in a series of random battles. I should also mention that everything here happens in real time. There is a pause button, but there's a lot you can't do while the game's paused, like move units. However, there's a nice option in the settings menu that lets you slow things down if you feel like the game is moving too fast. There are a few differences in how each faction operates on the galactic map, so you get a different experience depending on who you're controlling. Like how the rebels have to send out C-3PO and R2-D2 to steal enemy technology, which eventually increases your tech level. This makes things a little more interesting I guess, but it's kind of hard to imagine them actually surviving these stealth missions all on their own. They weren't exactly known as master thieves in the movies. We did it! It still ties in well with the general theme of the Rebellion though. They're the underdogs who have to rely more on underhand tactics like stealth to beat the Empire. The Consortium has the most unique feature of the three. Instead of just attacking enemy planets to gain control, you can corrupt them. You do this by sending out special units to engage in altruistic charitable activities like bribery, intimidation, or establishing a black market, which gives you various benefits like earning you more credits or weakening enemy forces. This, in my opinion, is totally badass, and it puts a fresh spin on things if you get tired of standard Empire vs. Rebel conflicts, but it can definitely get annoying to deal with if you're playing against the Consortium. The final thing I'll mention about the Galactic Map is that you have the ability to auto-resolve conflicts, although this puts you at a significant disadvantage because the AI doesn't like you enough to actually do well in these automated fights. You're basically guaranteed to lose more units than you would have had you played it out manually but it's still a decent option to have if you're short on time, or maybe you want to replay the campaign missions without having to fight all the planetary battles in between. Okay, so now I'll move on to the best part of the game, the space combat. And the first thing you'll probably notice is how incredibly authentic it looks and sounds. There's no mistaking this for anything other than Star Wars. Let's do some damage. The audio and visuals during space battles are fantastic, whether it's just a few ships fighting each other or a giant battle where it's hard to even figure out what's going on. The developers went for an experience that really captures the nature and style of space fights in the movies, and they definitely nailed it. Throw in some tracks from John Williams' score and any Star Wars fan can appreciate this. Mods that update the graphics put things into perspective a little bit, but that shouldn't take away from how impressive this was back when it came out. I think the coolest part of the design is definitely the scale of the ships. Your fighters and bombers are just tiny gnats compared to big capital and super ships, which makes it look kinda crazy to actually take one of these things down with your bombers. And when they're destroyed, capital ships break apart and float around in space while the battle continues, which looks pretty awesome. There's also a battle cam view you can switch to at any time, which is supposed to make things look more cinematic. It's a cool idea, but sometimes it works about as well as a GoPro tied to a squirrel. It'll focus on random places or angles that just don't show anything interesting. And then when it does decide to hone in on the action, it'll cut away after just a few seconds. But there's another option that works much better. The unit preview camera is essentially the same thing, except you have manual control over it. You might have already noticed one of the most interesting features of space combat. Space stations and bigger ships have hard points you can target to destroy specific functions. Want to stop a ship from moving around too much? Target its engines. Taking too much damage? Target its torpedoes or lasers. Concentrating fire on vital points lets you be more strategic with your approach, and it made these fights just seem more realistic. It makes sense to go after certain parts of a ship instead of peppering their entire surface with fire like you see in some other RTS games. But the single biggest factor in how successful you are during space combat is what kind of fleet you show up with. Having a lot of ships is obviously helpful. There's a limit to how many you can deploy at once, but whenever one goes down you can immediately send another in, so outlasting your opponent with endless reinforcements can work if you have the stronger economy but it's not usually as simple as just doing that. What's also important is what type of ships you have. Send in the wrong ships and the enemy might give you a fireworks show. 
The bare bones of it are that capitals counter frigates, frigates counter corvettes, and corvettes counter fighters and bombers. There are more variations too, like fighters are good against other fighters and certain frigates do well against other frigates. You don't have to give yourself an aneurysm trying to figure out what a ship's strengths and weaknesses are, because the game just tells you, so it's easy not to get confused here. Using a fleet made up of only capital ships might look cool, but it's rarely optimal, and you're almost always better off with a balanced fleet. However, actually using these different ship types correctly can sometimes be a challenge. Bombers are the best example. They can help you take down capital ships, but they're squishy as hell, so you'll have to send them in at just the right moment to keep them alive. They're very cheap though, so chances are you'll have some in reserve if you mess up. All the standard space units for the Empire and Rebellion seem well balanced, with their own distinct strengths and weaknesses. This isn't quite the case in Forces of Corruption though, because consortium fleets tend to be a bit stronger. There are other factors to consider too, like movement speed, blind spots, environmental hazards like asteroid fields, and the formation and positioning of your fleet can put you at an advantage or disadvantage. Hero ships and super ships can be formidable opponents or allies, and ships have special abilities that need to be used at the right moment to be most effective. Empire at War isn't the deepest RTS out there, but there's definitely enough strategy involved that trying to master its mechanics takes some effort. However, you don't have to master it to deal with the game's AI. As long as you have a decent understanding of good tactics, then you should be able to win most of the time on medium difficulty, and can probably do pretty well on hard. Land battles aren't as fun or as cool looking as space battles, but I was still able to have a pretty good time with them. This portion of the game is closer to more traditional, ground-based RTS gameplay. But make no mistake, it doesn't play like an Age of Empires clone. If that's what you're looking for, you might want to check out Galactic Battlegrounds instead. You won't build up huge bases filled with defensive structures, march hundreds of troops into massive battles, or mercilessly butcher sheep. Ground fights in Empire at War are relatively small in scale and don't usually last very long. So what's cool about them? Well, the first thing I liked was the variety of different planets you fight on and how they affect combat. Before a battle starts, you're shown a screen that lists various information about the planet, like historical data, what advantages you gain by taking it over, and how ugly the local inhabitants are. But what's most important to the actual fighting is a planet's weather and the allegiance of its population. Weather conditions affect certain units' accuracy or sight range, which adds a little variety to what troops you send in since you want to avoid using those at a disadvantage. Visually, I thought most of the standard ground maps look pretty bland, but some of those with weather effects look a step above the rest. You might also have to defeat a hostile local population in addition to enemy forces. But sometimes they'll ally with you instead, giving you free units you can use as meat shields to prevent damage to your real forces. Local populations provide some pretty entertaining moments. Watching a bunch of little huts squirm towards you and then mowing them down isn't something you normally have the privilege of witnessing in other Star Wars games. When it comes to vehicles and troops, they're balanced in a similar way as ships with obvious strengths and weaknesses. Even though it does have weaknesses, it should still go without saying that the AT-AT Walker is the best ground unit. Because, well, look at it. However, the Consortium comes pretty close with their Ewok handlers and Rancor riders. You start most land battles with a low, maximum unit capacity, and to increase it, you have to capture reinforcement points across the map. This, along with the relatively small size of most maps, are what makes the battles fast-paced, since it forces you to be proactive, which leads to more enemy engagements. There are a few defensive structures you can use. Build pads scattered across the map let you construct turrets or healing stations. And if you're the faction occupying the planet, you have access to more structures on the galactic map. One of the biggest criticisms against ground combat in the base game was that you couldn't choose where to build ground structures, which means that it was missing one of the most important strategic elements of base building. The Forces of Corruption expansion fixed this to some degree by adding that in, but you still can't be as precise with it as you can in a lot of other RTS games. So I really only liked investing in defensive structures when I had extra credits to spend. And because I didn't like this restriction, I usually stuck to the old adage that the best defense is a good offense. There are a few other features that help make ground combat interesting. The most notable are bombing strikes and hero units. If you have bombers in your fleet above a planet, you can call them in periodically to pulverize any area that you've discovered on the map. Some heroes are really powerful during ground combat, and they're one of my favorite parts of land battles. Blasting units with Darth Vader's force powers or shocking them as Palpatine is a pretty good time, and Chewbacca turns the game into Grand Theft Star Wars since he can hijack enemy vehicles. There are quite a few of these heroes, and some of them are absolute tanks who just eat damage. There's one mission during the Empire campaign where you go into full-blown serial killer mode and just run around as the Emperor by himself murdering all of the locals. There's also a skirmish mode, and it's good for if you want to hop into battles quickly without having to babysit planets on the galactic map. Oh, and it's great for multiplayer, if you can find anyone to play with. There aren't many people playing online these days. The actual combat follows the same principles as the other modes, but the way you build units and manage resources makes the experience more like a conventional RTS game. 
You can play on land or in space, and in both, there's a heavy focus on trying to control mining facilities to boost your economy. And you build units and upgrades from either your space station or structures at your base. Probably what I like the most about skirmishes is the ability to team up with other players or the game's AI to get into really big battles, and even get into three-way fights with all three factions at once on certain maps. I think everyone who knows anything about Empire at War is aware of its active modding community, and some of the major overhauls they've pumped out. These are impressive mods that provide tons of content and basically serve as complete games on their own. A lot of the people who play Empire at War these days pretty much exclusively play the mods because of all of the improvements and enhancements they add, and they're worth checking out after you've spent some time with the base game and its expansion. Republic at War is a Clone Wars mod that's been around for a long time. It flips the setting to the Clone Wars era from the prequel movies and replaces the Empire and the Rebellion with the Republic and the Confederacy. You get new units, new maps, and a more aggressive AI. But overall, it plays a lot like the original game, so it's easy to hop into and get started right away. Thrawn's Revenge is definitely one of the most popular Empire at War mods. It's named after the antagonist of Avatar, I mean of Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire book series. And like the books, the mod is set after the events of the original trilogy. It adds a lot of major changes and updates the graphics significantly. It looks great, and it's a lot bigger and has way more depth than the original game. There are several new factions, lots of new units, challenging new galactic conquest scenarios like From the Ground Up, and major alterations to core gameplay mechanics, like the era system which replaces tech levels, new resources to manage, and more, which makes this a very interesting mod to dive into. Fall of the Republic is another Clone Wars mod, but this one's newer. It's made by the same people who made Thrawn's Revenge, and you'll see some of the same changes you see there. If you're looking for a more modern Clone Wars mod with lots of depth, this is the way to go. Both Thrawn's Revenge and Fall of the Republic still receive regular updates, and there are plenty of useful guides and videos explaining their mechanics, which can help you adjust to their complexity. Empire at War Remake is another big overhaul mod that's been considered complete since its 4.0 update. It gives the game a major graphical overhaul with some really cool visual effects and tons of new audio files. But it's not just like an enhanced edition with gameplay identical to the original. It also adds in a bunch of new features and changes that make it its own unique experience. I'm not very familiar with Awakening of the Rebellion, and it seems like it's a little harder to get into than the other mods I've mentioned, but I've seen some people say that it's their favorite one. It's inspired by the older strategy game Star Wars Rebellion, and it adds a lot of content and apparently can get pretty difficult, so if you want a challenge, this might be what you're looking for. Overall, I've had a good time with Empire at War. It is a relatively simple strategy game, so more hardcore fans of the genre might not like that, which I understand. But sometimes it's nice to have something that's a little quicker and easier to get the hang of. And plus, if you're looking for something more complex, there are definitely mods that do that. If you buy Empire at War, you're best off getting it on Steam, so you have access to multiplayer and the Steam Workshop. The $20 price might seem high for a game this old, but when you factor in all the free content you get from mods, I think it's a good deal. <laughs>